The following is a special presentation from Pastor Joanne Ramsey and Speak the Word Ministries. We trust God's Word will bless you as you listen to this message. Here's Pastor Joe. This morning, I really would like to talk to you just a little bit about refocusing and rebooting. I spoke a little bit about this a few weeks ago over in Chesapeake. Uh, not the entire message, uh, but some of it. But I really feel like that um, it's worth repeating uh, the parts that I am going to repeat. And not only refocusing, but rebooting. Or we could call it, call it pressing on and upward, because that's what we're going to be doing in these months to come. We're going to be pressing on and upward. You know, most of us are familiar with the terminology reboot, reboot. We do it, uh, some of us do it every day. It means, for example, to restart our computers, our phones, our smart devices. Uh, in other words, to get a new start. And so I'm told, you know, my technician tells me, uh, constantly telling me, Pastor, you need to reboot the computer, you know, once in a while, you know, because I forget. I just let it run and run. It never cuts off day or night. And so every now and then uh, we have to uh, reboot our phones in order to, for it to work properly. And any time that it's not working properly, we have to reboot it. And usually that will solve the problem nine times out of ten. And, and sometimes we get in a, a mindset and, and a way of thinking that we need to be rebooted. We, we need to refocus. Our, our thoughts need to be refocused. Our words need to be refocused. And we, we, we really just all, I think, need a rebooting. David told me once when I was discouraged about something that I needed to pull myself up by my bootstraps, whatever that meant. Yeah. <laughs> I really didn't know what he meant. He meant that I needed to stop focusing on the problem and give it to the Lord and move on. And that's what we all need to do now. We need to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and stop focusing on what's going on in the natural today and in the world around us. And, and just move on and just give it to the Lord and just move on. We, don't, we are giving Satan absolutely too much credit. We're praising him and we should be praising our Father. I'd like to begin this morning by sharing with you a story about a man that was obedient to God even when it made no sense. You know, saints, at times, I know there's times in my lives that the Lord has impressed upon me to do something in the natural that it didn't make any, absolutely any sense to me at all. But because I love the Lord and because you love the Lord, we trust him and we're going to do it anyway, right? Yeah. Right. The story begins like this. A man was sleeping one night in his cabin when suddenly his room filled with light and God appeared. The Lord told the man he had work for him to do and showed him a large rock in front of his cabin. The Lord explained that he was to push against the rock with all of his might. So... This the man did. He did it day after day. For many years he toiled from sun up to sun down. His shoulders set squarely against the cold massive surface of the unmoving rock, pushing with all of his might. Each night the man returned to his cabin, sore and worn out, feeling that his whole day had been spent in vain. You know, do you ever feel that way, brothers and sisters? Do you feel like that you've been laboring in vain? Like maybe you've been spinning your wheels? with the work that you're doing. I know sometimes I do. But then I recognized that none of my efforts for the kingdom, no matter how small they might be or no matter how insignificant they might seem at the time, is ever in vain. Even if sometimes it may feel that way or look that way, it, they're never, our efforts are never, no matter how small or insignificant, are ever in vain. Since the man was showing discouragement, the adversary, the devil, showed up and put thoughts into the weary man's mind. Of course he did. The devil will do it every time. He will show up when you're the most vulnerable, which is when you are the most susceptible to physical or emotional attack or harm. The devil said to the man, you have been pushing against that rock for a long time, and it hasn't moved an inch. This, of course, gave the man the impression that the task was impossible and that he was, fa uh, that he was a failure. These thoughts discouraged and disheartened the man. And Satan said, why kill yourself over this? I, 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 you know, the enemy tells me that a lot. You know, why, why are you worrying all about this? Stuff? Just, just, put it, just put in your time. Just give, you know, just give the minimum effort. And that'll be good enough. So many people do that on their jobs every day. They show up to work. They, they don't recognize that God sees everything they do. And, and, and they're really not, the Bible, according to the Word of God, you're not working for them, you're working for the Lord. 
and actually promotions coming from the Lord. So as long as you're put going there, get showing up early, putting in a little extra time, doing what you need to do, then the Lord sees it and He rewards you. And a lot of people mistake think it's coming from their employer, but it's not. It's coming from the Lord because He's the one that's going to impress upon your employer to see that what's going on. He's going to make sure they see what you're doing. But he also is going to see that he's going to that they, uh, he's going to make sure that he sees when you're not doing right. But brothers and sisters, that's the exact opposite from what the Word of God tells you to do. In Colossians three verse twenty three in the Amplified Bible, it says, "Whatever may be the task, work at it hardly from the soul as something done for the Lord and not for man." So that's the very and so that's what the weary man decided to do. But first he decided to make it a matter of prayer and take his troubled thoughts to the Lord. Lord, he said, I have been labored long and hard in your service, putting all my strength to do that which you have asked me. Yet after all this time, I have not budged that rock a half a centimeter or a millimeter. He said, what's wrong? He said, why am I failing? And the Lord answered him, my friend, when I asked you to serve me and you accepted, I told you that your task was to push the rock with all your strength, which is what you've done. Never once did I mention to you that I expected you to move it. <laughs> Think about that. You know, we're still pushing against doors that God has not told us to open yet. He'll open those doors when the time comes. Are you hearing me? Hallelujah. Saints, when God calls you to do something, He does not expect you to do it alone, but by faith through grace. Are you hearing me? Most people fail to accomplish the task God gives them because they try to do things on their own. We're all, we're, we humans are so famous for that. We feel like if we're not putting our little two cents worth in, that it's not going to get done. And, and we're very impatient. And I, I, and I could write a, a book on impatience. David's always telling me that I want it yesterday. You know, and most of us do. We want it yesterday. The Lord said to the man, you, your task was to push. In Zechariah 4, 6, it says, This is the word of the Lord, not by my might, my power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And now God said to the man, you came to me with your strength spent, thinking that you had failed. But is that really so? He said, look at yourself. He says, your arms are strong and muscled. He says, your back is shiny and brown. Your hands are all callous from constant pressure. He says, your legs have become massive and hard. Through opposition, the Lord said, you have grown much, and your abilities now surpass that which you have that you used to have. It's, it's through opposition that we are going to grow. It, it, that's when our abilities are going to be increased. When it's against opposition. It's never when you're on top of the mountain that we're growing. It's always when we're down in the valley. It's when we're coming against those op obstacles. It's when we're coming against those oppositions. True, he says, you have not moved the rock, but, but your calling was to be obedient and to push and to exercise your faith and trust in my wisdom. I'm going to repeat that. But your calling was to be obedient and to push and to exercise your faith and to trust in my wisdom. That, he says, you have done. Now, my friend, I will move the rock. Hallelujah. Now, if you get out of my way, that don't mean that you sit back and do nothing when the Lord gives you an assignment. But you don't try to do his part. You just do his part. And you just sit back and let him open the door. Let him move the rock. Let him get that obstacle out of your way. Whatever that obstacle is that's keeping you from getting that job or whatever that hindrance is that's keeping you from receiving your full, complete healing, whatever it is, you, you just trust the Lord and in his abilities to do what has to be done. Amen. Now, my friend, he says, I'm going to move it. You know, and the Lord tells us not to lean on our own understanding. In Proverbs uh, chapter 3, verse 5 in the New Living Bible, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all you do, and He will show you which path to take. I, I, I repeat that a lot. And when I go to bed at night, 
sometime or another before I go to sleep because I, I usually fall to bed listen, uh, sleep listening to scriptures and sometimes I have to keep going back because I fall asleep so I listen to Second Thessalonians two or three times this week. But the version that I quote is a little bit different from this, you know, because when it, and, uh, in Proverbs it says, I trust, you know, I trust the Lord with all my heart. I shall lean not unto my own understanding, but I shall acknowledge him in all of my ways and he shall direct my paths. And this is so true. When we acknowledge the Lord in all of our ways, He'll always direct our paths. Hallelujah. At times when we hear a word from God, we tend, to use, we tend to use our own intellect to decipher what He wants or what He means. When actually what God wants is just simple obedience and faith in Him. That's really what the Lord wants. He wants simple obedience and faith in Him. By all means, I say to you this morning, brothers and sisters, exercise the faith that moves mountains, but know that it is still God who moves the mountains. Hallelujah. Remember again in Zechariah 4, 6, not by my might nor by my power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Saints, true obedience comes from the heart. Sacrifices offered in a spirit of humility are the only Sacrifices acceptable to the Lord. David knew that his obedience and not the performance of religious rituals, which we have become so famous for, was what was most important to God. God is not impressed with large churches. He's not impressed with uh, so many things uh, that the people are impressed with. He's impressed with the heart and the obedience of his servants. None of these, there's nothing wrong with these things. But I'm saying they don't impress him. Amen. And sometimes, I think somebody said they did a survey not long ago of two churches, one about 20,000, one about 30,000. And they said after going through the church, and they wanted the people to evaluate the church to see if there was something they could do and improve on and what was wrong. But after they had uh, done the survey, uh, what their, their conclusion was that the people didn't need, there was, most of them didn't need God. Most of them felt like they didn't need God. You know, some people get to the point where we think, you think that you can do it on your own, but you can't do it on your own. I, you'd be so foolish to even think that you could. I can remember back in the early 90s because of a lot of bad decisions I'd gotten myself into, I'd uh, gotten myself into a lot of debt. And some of you may have heard me talk about this on previous messages or maybe even here, I don't know. However, I think it's an awesome example of obedience, and I think it bears repeating, because I learned from this experience that if I wanted the Lord to help me, I had to be totally obedient, not just partial obedient. Sometimes the Lord will give us an assignment, and we think we're being obedient, but we, maybe we didn't, maybe we weren't totally obedient. In my case, I was only partial obedient, and because of it, I had to suffer a lot longer than I would have had to. And some of us in here this morning the same way. Shortly after I became a Christian, the Lord called me to the ministry. Most of, uh, some of you know that. As some of you know, when the Lord called me to the ministry, he sent me to the jail and to the prison to minister to the men and women there. And at first, I didn't feel like I could possibly do that and work. But as a matter of fact, and, and I wasn't thrilled. I, I really wasn't thrilled with the idea of ministering to the inmates in the jail. As a matter of fact, I, I thought that would make me, make my husband look bad, make me look bad. I mean, look, you know, I had to think about my position. You know, my husband is the county manager. And how is that going to look with me going into the jails, and the prisons? But you know, you just go. The Lord don't always start you out with a 30,000 uh, 30, Con thousand congregation. He may never give you one. Right. May never. But if you'll keep pushing on that rock that he gave you to push on, he'll move it. And those, the time is coming, and this is prophetic, the time is coming, and it's soon, that those that feel like they have not been recognized or acknowledged for their service are going to be first. The last is going to be first. So you have nothing to be fretting about. Just keep on being obedient. Keep forgiving those that persecute you. Keep praying for them. And God's going to put you first. And he's going to surprise a lot of you. 
even myself included. <laughs> Hallelujah. Rain on, Lord, rain on. I thought to myself, you know, because, you know, I'd made this big debt, so I, I thought that uh, I needed to work, you know, part-time to help pay it off, you know. And so I, since I thought I, I couldn't minister full-time, the Lord was saying he wanted me to minister full-time, but I, I was letting the Lord know right away I couldn't do that. <laughs> because I needed to work part-time so I could help pay off some of this debt. I felt like it was uh, my responsibility because I really felt like since I had made this debt that I needed to work and help pay it off. But since what I was doing is better known as human reasoning, <laughs> we get into that human reasoning of the soul and trying to figure things out. However, the Lord let me know right away that I was to minister full time. And after I argued with the Lord about this for a few months, <laughs> I, I did. I, he got me at the garden club one day on a Wednesday, and he set me straight. <laughs> it's either full time or nothing, you know. <laughs> But he also let me know that he would take care of my debt, which at that time was a little over $35,000. But there was three things. The Lord's always going to give you some things to do. Sometimes he will give you one or two. Sometimes he may not give you anything, but I think he will give you something. But he gave me three things that I would need to do for this to take place. For him to meet that need, I did two out of the three. But because of fear, I couldn't bring myself to trust God with the third thing. Fear is a spirit. It's the big weapon that Satan uses and his demonic spirits uses against God's children. It's fear that's pushing this virus. It's fear that's pushing all this stuff that's going on, destruction and stuff. It's fear that's pushing it. And, 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 it, and, and just little old me or little old you, not a problem for him to come in. And, of course, I was you know, fairly new believer, you know. I wasn't, you know, maybe a couple of years in Christ, you know. I hadn't, I hadn't learned so much I hadn't learned. They still, after 25 years, there's still a lot I haven't learned and, and need to learn. I, and so I sure can't say I've arrived by no means. And I still slip from time to time. But he says the righteous will fall seven times and he'll pick them right back up. So I'm not counting. <laughs> or, oh, no, you're counting. I'm not counting. I did two out of the three things, like I said, because the fear. I thought the third thing was too much of a risk, and I didn't want to take a chance. I thought that if I did that third thing, that I might lose everything. And I wasn't sure if I was willing to take that risk. Some of you in here may have been against the same thing, that the Lord's asked you to do certain things, and it could be with a friend, or it could be with your job, it could be with a family member, but you don't want to take that risk because you feel like it's going to lose too much. But God's never going to give you anything and tell you to do anything that's not going to be for your betterment, for your good. As I said, I thought that was too much of a risk, so I didn't totally put my trust in him to handle everything. However, after two years, he did pay off the debt in full, just as he promised he would. Even with enough left over, I might add, to buy my husband a new truck. Hallelujah. <laughs> then I went to, and then one Sunday morning, and we we're really famous for this, we love... You know, this time I was really boasting on the Lord, but the Lord, he intervened on this one. <laughs> then one Sunday morning as I was standing in the 50-man cell at the jail and was ministering to the inmates there, I was testifying, giving testimony to the inmates to how God had paid off my debt and how I had suffered over the, oh, I had suffered, you know, I had suffered so much over these past two years. Saints, <laughs> I got news for you. We will suffer. We're going to suffer from the hands of the enemy when we fall for his lies instead of trusting the Lord to help us. We're always going to suffer at his hands. I had suffered with unbelievable guilt over what I had done because every time I'd write out a check to make a payment on this debt, I was reminded of my bad decision. Has the devil ever reminded any of you in here this morning or listening online of your past mistakes? How many times has he beat you up over it over and over again? He does it every time. You need to know that it was not the Lord making me feel guilty, and it is not the Lord making you feel guilty either. And I'm going to back up here just a second and talk about this for just a minute. I was writing out checks. We had a joint checking account. We had two accounts. We had one from the military and one from the state, the government, county, state, or whatever. When I was writing out those checks, my husband was was a military officer 
controlled a lot of men, county manager over five counties, college graduate, this and that and the other. And here I'm thinking he can't add. As a matter of fact, he excelled in mathematics. That was one of his strong points, that and people. The Lord was asking me to do something, was to tell my husband, the third thing was to tell my husband something about the loan. And I thought if I told him that he would be so mad with me that he would leave. And I didn't want to take the risk. So I only did two other things. The enemy had so, me in so much fear. And when he gets you in fear, he messes with your mind. If, if I had been thinking straight, then I would have recognized that Jim already knew he's deceased now. Uh, been deceased for almost about 18 years. I would have recognized that he knew already. Just like God knew. God knew, he knew. But Jim loved me and he didn't want to say anything. And so he let it go because we were paying it off, you know. But like I said, you know, when, when the enemy puts that fear on you, he can make you think, make, confuse you. This morning I had to go in the bathroom and, and rebuke that spirit of confusion because from the moment I was getting dressed, it was a spirit of confusion. I even had to go back and get my iPad. I said, well, I could preach from the phone like Pastor Larry, but I don't know if my prince is big. You know, it, it was like that all morning. It was a spirit of confusion. And, and so I just went into the bathroom and I took authority over it. And, and I knew it was going to be a powerful message because the enemy was trying to distract me so much that somebody on, watching online or in this congregation this morning needs to hear at least one of these words. And I said, Satan, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus and I take authority over that spirit of confusion and I command you to leave my body, flee it right now in the name of Jesus. You're trespassing on holy ground. I command you to go in the name of Jesus. And this is what we have to do. We have to exert our authority. As children of God, you have to exert your authority. It, it could be any time. It doesn't matter. Any place, any time. If you're shopping if you're in the bathroom, wherever you are, don't let him get the last word in. Don't let him get any words in. As a matter of fact, Jesus didn't let him get no words in. He just says, shut up, be quiet. He didn't let him get one word out. And we got to, and, and isn't that what Jesus said? We, we need to be like him. He said, be imitators. Well, I was trying my best to be an imitator. <laughs> so, <laughs> praise God forevermore. But I, like I was saying, it was Satan who was accusing me. The Bible distinctly tells you this in Revelation 12, 11, that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He's the one that brings our name up before our Father every day, accusing us. And Romans 8, 1 also tells you in, the, in uh, Romans 8, 1, that uh, now therefore there is no condemnation for him that's in Christ Jesus. So if we are all in here this morning, I, I, I think we are, and those listening, we are in Christ Jesus. So since we're in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation for him that's in Christ Jesus. Are you hearing me? Recognize who you are in your authority. Praise the Lord. He was the one who had caused me so much fear that I couldn't do the third thing that God asked me to do. I just couldn't bring myself to do the third thing. The Lord tells us, I want you to listen to this. The Lord tells us, reminds us of how amazed that we're going to be when we see who brought all this fear and terror upon us. Remember what the Lord tells us in Isaiah 14, verses 16 and 17, in the voice translation, it says in verse 16, people peer down at you from above, talking about Satan, and their curiosity overflows. The people will say, wow, is this the man who once terrorized the world? You're going to see a little old bitty tiny thing all swiveled up. It says, is he the one who rocked the earth's kingdoms and threatened us with disaster? Isn't he the one that's doing that now? Isn't he trying to rock the kingdom? Isn't he trying to threaten us with disaster everywhere we go? 
And verse 17, is he the one who turned the bustling cities of the world into a wasteland and never let the prisoners of war go home? Think about that. Saints, the Lord spoke very clearly to me that Sunday morning and said, as I was giving testimony to the inmates, I did not have to, he let me know, I did not have to suffer the two years. It was my, it was my lack of obedience and trust in him that made me suffer. Are you hearing me? He said, if I had been obedient, that it could have been taken care of sooner. So it really wasn't God's fault that I suffered. It was my own. It was my own doing. Some of us in here this morning, it's our own doings. And it's still my own doings sometimes when I mess up. So many times we blame God for things that don't happen the way we want them to happen. Or maybe when, or when we want them to happen. When, when really it is our lack of faith in His ability to help us. It reminds me of the stubbornness of Pharaoh. After God sent ten plagues on Egypt, one of those plagues being a plague of frogs. These frogs, if you read it in, uh, in uh, Exodus, you'll find out in Exodus 8, these frogs were everywhere. They were in their beds. The, the Bible says they were in their shoes. They were in their stoves. They were in the food. They were everywhere. And Moses wanted to pray for the frogs to be gone and asked Pharaoh when he wanted him to pray for the frogs to be gone. And you know what Pharaoh said in Exodus 18? He said, tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> we are so guilty. You might as well agree. <laughs> Lord wants you to do something just tomorrow, Lord, just one more day. <laughs> I, I said that a lot, you know, when the Lord was... Uh, convicted me of becoming a Christian, you know, uh, tr attract me. He wasn't convicting me, he was attracting me. And, I, and I, I didn't say it out loud, but I was thinking, let me get past this weekend, I got a party. <laughs> and it's my understanding that once I become a Christian, I can't party. So let me get past this weekend. Next weekend was, let me get past this trip. And on and on it goes, because it's lie upon lie upon lie upon lie upon lie. Because actually, once you accept the Lord as your Lord and Savior, you lose all interest in those material things. You lose all interest in those, that kind of party. And you can still party, but it's a different kind of partying. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I've never been so happy in all my life for the last 25 years. <laughs> you know, and, and, and just lie upon lie. He didn't have to wait one more day. It was his choice to wait and not God's. It was the same with me. When the Lord told me what to do and how he would take care of my situation, I didn't have to suffer two more years. But as I said before, I was too afraid to trust him completely. I didn't understand, as some of you listed online and some of you in this congregation this morning, I didn't understand that he already knew the ending. And he, he, he says that he knew the ending and he knew it would be okay if I would just trust him. Saints, he knows the ending from the beginning. He is the Alpha and the Omega. In Isaiah 46, verse 10, in the God Word translation, it says, From the beginning, he said, I reveal the end. From long ago, I told you things that had not yet happened, saying, My plan will stand, and I'll do everything I intended to do. My point is this. When everything seems to go wrong and nothing is working, just push in other words, pray until something happens. Yeah. Just keep putting your trust in the Lord. Just keep pushing and pray until something happens. When your job gets to be too much, just push. When people hurt you, and they will, and they don't, and they don't do as you think they should, and they will, and you have trouble forgiving them, and you will, just push. Use the love that God has shed abroad in my heart and your heart by the Holy Spirit, according to Romans 5, 5, and just keep on pushing. Keep on moving upward. Keep on moving, pressing on and moving upward. When you have trouble finding the right work or, work or a job that meets your financial needs, just push. Remember that God is the one who does the promoting and lifting up, according to Psalm 75, verses 6 and 7, and just keep on pushing. When you feel called to the ministry, and a lot of you are listening online may uh, be doing this and some in here, but when you feel called to the ministry and you aren't getting an answer to your prayers, 
and you're beginning to feel like a bench warmer in the kingdom of God, never lose heart. Believe me, be ready when he calls your name because he will call your name. Be ready. When your money's all gone and the bills are due, just keep on pushing. In other words, keep on trusting in the God of more than enough. The God that owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. Hallelujah. Remember your, as I said, remember your father owns the cattle on a thousand hills, according to Psalms 50, verse 10. And if need be, praise God, he will sell one just for you. So just keep on pushing and keep on pressing on. I know there's times he must have sold a few cows for me because if he hadn't, I'd have never made it. <laughs> Hallelujah. The word of God is full of inspiring assurances of how God will provide for his children. And Psalms 84, 11 says, For the Lord is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor, and no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. God is fully aware of your needs in here today. And he wants you to have the confidence to come to him with every deed and all your cares and cast them upon him, as he tells you to do in 1 Peter 5, 7. Put your trust in his power and ability to help you. In John 14, verses 13 and 14, it says, what, he says, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything, anything in my name, he says, I'll do it. In closing, let me say this. I know there are many here today or listening online that are in need of something from our Father. I want you to know that he knows what's going on in your life, and that he will provide for you. To you, your situation may seem hopeless, but the Lord God is a big God, and he's a good father. He's a good, good father. A good, good father. And he is still in the business of making beautiful things out of our messes. Hallelujah. And a lot of us can testify to that because he has certainly made a, uh, made, taken care of a lot of our messes. Praise the Lord. A word of wisdom, when you find yourself in a hole, quit digging. <laughs> Let me say that again. When you find yourself in a hole, quit digging. In other words, if what you've been doing is not working, change directions. Change what you've been saying. And, and stop speaking death over your life over your family, over your friends, over your job, over your ministry. Begin to speak life into your homes and into your jobs and into your families and, all, and speak life over your body and call it healed in the name of Jesus. According to God's word in Romans 4, 17, it says you have to call those things that be not as though they are. He's leaving it up to us. We are the ones that is going to change things in our lives. God has given us the recipe. He's given us his word. And if we would take this word and apply it to what every circumstance or situation we might be going through, it, it will work. But we must take this and we must call these things. We must speak these things out loud. We must call these things into existence. That's what God did. He didn't think about it when he was creating the heavens and the earth. He spoke it. He spoke over the void, you know, void. Everything was void. And he brought life just through his word. And the Holy Spirit was just hovering, hovering. You know, the Holy Spirit is hovering over us today. He's just hovering, waiting for you to open your mouth and, and say something. Your angels are standing by this morning to hearken to your words and to hasten to bring them about. That's what the Word of God says in Psalm. He said he has, his, he has sent His angels to hearken. That means to listen, hear the words, and hasten, and in other words, to hurry up and, and, and cause them to come to bow. And God said, you know, He said in Jeremiah, I think it's Jeremiah, He said He is active and alert to perform His Word. But He cannot perform something that He does not that you should not give Him. So he's told you to call those things that be not as though they already are. In other words, speak into existence, write down, begin to write down, put scripture with it, write down 
and call that the things that you need to change that you're calling whether it's a new job promotion uh, ministry uh, health or whatever it is and begin to speak these things according to the word of God into your life begin to speak life and not death the Bible says that he's given us a choice in Deuteronomy he says I call together I call today heaven and earth against you he said I have set before you today life and, uh, curses and blessings he said shoot uh, life and death he said choose blessings you know you don't even have to figure it out he tells you which ones to choose and cho choose life it's up to you and me to put God in remembrance of his word in Isaiah 43 26 I, I preach on this a lot he said to it says to put him in remembrance of his word so that he said put me in remembrance of my word so I can plead your case with you and Job twenty two twenty eight 28, Amplified Bible says, You shall also decide and decree a thing, and it shall be established for you, and the light of God's favor shall shine upon your ways. You tell that sickness in your body, Hear the word of the Lord. Yes. Hear the word of the Lord. And then you begin to say what his word said, and about how he sent his word. You begin, when you begin to tell your body, Remind your body of that, you know, where he sent his word. The Bible says he sent his word, and it removed all sickness and destruction from your bodies. And so when you're putting him in remembrance of uh, him sending the word, that's what you're doing. When you say, Father, I think it's that you sent your word. And when you sent that word, the word, it, it just removed, the power is in the word of God. And, it, and it's faith in the name, in that name, in that name of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, that's power. And so he said, I sent my word, and it healed you and delivered you from all destruction. All, all destruction. Praise the Lord. By his stripes, I'm healed. 1 Peter 2.24. By his stripes. In Matthew 8.17, he says right there that he took, that by his stripes you're healed, and he took, every, he took all your sickness and took every infirmity. So yesterday when I was praying, I said, you foul spirit of infirmity. <laughs> I didn't know exactly what it was I was, uh, what was going on in my body, but I knew it was a foul spirit of infirmity. <laughs> so you don't necessarily have to know all the details to speak to it. You're the one that's got the badge. You know, uh, the devil is afraid of that badge. He's not afraid of you. He's afraid of the badge, you know, who you represent. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If you're in debt, you do the same thing. You say, debt, hear the word of the Lord. Debt, I call you paid in full in, the, in Jesus' name. And I don't have time to preach on that subject, but I know 18 years ago, I spoke to that just as the Lord gave me directions to to it and paid $100,000 worth of hospital bills off. So I don't have time to preach on that, but I speak from experience. And uh, most, of, a lot of you in here can speak, and I know Pastor Larry Neil can do speak for, uh, and others can speak from experience. I thank you, Lord, that I owe no man nothing but the debt of love. I used to confess that so much. Hallelujah. I thank you that you're my source. Always recognize and acknowledge who your source is. It's not your job. It's not your family. It's not the government. God is our source. He's responsible. But the only way that he's going to do the things he says he, he's going to do if we put our total confidence in, a, in, in him and then be fully obedient when he speaks to us and don't be part don't be foolish like I was in which I probably have been since but never to that extent because the more you grow in Christ the more you recognize that he knows everything he sees everything and so he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the, end, uh, the beginning from the end. He can see around the curve. We can't see around the curve, but he can see. He knows what's there. And a lot of times things will happen in the natural that we can't understand. 
because it, to, in, to us in the natural, everything looks good and there's no reason for some things happening, but God sees around the curve and he's protecting you. He let me know that uh, when my husband passed away a, a couple of weeks later, he gave me a verse on that. He could see around the corner and then he knew how bad it was going to be. And, and so, like I said, he, the, actually the scripture says that he protected him. God is always there. Did he take his life? No. But he protected him from what the enemy had plans to do to him. You know, and, and so, uh, and a lot of times, like I said, we in the natural, we can't see this happening. But it does. Father God, I thank you so much. I thank you, Lord, that in spite of the obstacles that were here this morning, I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your faithfulness, and thank you, Father, for yours, and Lord Jesus, I thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're always here to speak through me. I thank you, God, that you always anoint my lips and put your words in my mouth and stand guard over them. I thank you, Father, today that you have prepared their hearts to, to, to hear and that you have opened up their ears to hear, and I thank you for that, Father. I thank you, Father, that this was a now word, and I thank you for it. I thank you for all those who are in here today and all those who are listening online. Father, I pray for supernatural protection over all that are listening and all in here. I pray for a hedge of protection around all of your children, Lord. I pray, Father, that the blinders will come off of not only the non-believers, but the believers also. So many believers are still in, walking in darkness and are being influenced by the evil around. Lord, I pray that they will begin to see and recognize that nothing compares to God Almighty, our Father. And Lord, I just thank you again for today. I thank you for this word. And I pray, Lord, that all that heard it will be blessed by this word, Lord. I pray that there was at least one word that was spoken that will minister to their spirits and encourage them in whatever is going on in their lives. For it's in the name of Jesus, we give you the praise and we give you all the honor. For it's in Jesus' name we praise and thank you. Amen.